I, one of my favorite things about church ministry is working with, with missionaries, both, uh, both stateside and abroad. Um, and the opportunity to, to hear from uh, missionaries, to find out what God is doing um, all around the world. I'm ex excited that we have a personal connection uh, with Nathan and Katie as she's you know, Mindy's sister. And so uh, we're thrilled to be able to support uh, a mission that we have a personal connection to. Uh, that's something that's very exciting. And so um, I'm just going to turn it over to them. Um, as they've said already, uh, my name is Nathan, and this is my wife, Katie. Um, she's the boss. So um, that's not just me making a joke. She's uh, the president of the organization, you know, so um, I'm helping her do a lot of things. You know, we're the missionaries and the founders of Loaf Ministries together. Um, and so it's our privilege and pleasure to just tell you a little bit about it. So some of you were here when we visited a few years ago, um, and we really hadn't gone yet. We'd been to Haiti a few times, but um, our ministry was not begun at that time. So it's great to come back to you um, and tell you about what we've been doing the last two or three years. So yeah, first off, um, thank you guys so much for becoming one of our supporting churches um, just in this past year. So um, again, not just we get to tell you what we are doing, uh, what God's doing through us, but we also get to tell you um, what you are helping God do through us, you know, what God is doing through you, through us, if, however you want to look at that. So um, we appreciate that very much. Okay, so our mission statement at Loaf Ministries is to seek and to save the lost, and we do this by providing education, encouragement, and resources to teenage girls who are in need. Specifically, we work with teen moms, uh, young women who are pregnant, don't have a good place to go, that kind of thing. This is just a picture of the one of the main streets in our town, just to kind of give you a little bit of flavor of what our city looks like. And we serve in the community of Lakai in Haiti, so you see that map? Of our arrow was cut off. So Our arrow is cut off. That's okay. We'll work on it. Um, we serve in the community of Lakai in Haiti. So you see Haiti is kind of shaped, sometimes we say like a backward C, sometimes we call it a pair of pants, um, however you want to look at it. Um, that red dot in the middle is not where we are. That's where we fly in. That is the capital city of Haiti. And then if you come follow it along the south coast over here, you can just see the little, little tip of a red arrow that's supposed to be pointing to the city of Lakai. Yeah, great. Thank you. Thanks. So that's where we are physically located. It's, uh, it's only 120 miles or so. Um, it takes us at least four hours on a good day to get there. Um, if there's problems with traffic, it's taken us as long as a good eight hours. And as I've said, we work with teenage girls who kind of unexpectedly discover that they are pregnant. Um, these are usually not healthy situations, as you can imagine. And so, yeah, so what we do. Um, first, we encourage them to keep and raise their babies themselves um, and empower them to be able to do that as a mom, to take their role as a mom and be able to actually take care of that child. Because um, so often you might love that child and you might want to be their mom, but you don't have what you need to be able to do it. And so we try to equip her with that. Um, and then we have a child, prayer, child care program um, so that while mom's at school, we take care of that baby. Um, so she doesn't have to worry about where they're at, who's taking care of them, if they're getting the food she left for them, things like that. She knows she has a safe place while she continues her education. Abortion is rampant in Haiti, just like it is here. Um, it's gonna be a little bit different. You're not gonna find a clinic, you're not gonna find a place to go to get an abortion, um, but it's gonna be you and your mom, or you and your best friend, or you and your boyfriend in the bathroom, or more than likely you don't actually have a bathroom. So in a room in your house, outside of your house, hiding somewhere, um, trying to terminate your pregnancy. And so obviously that comes with a lot of health risks for the mom, um, but also it's a choice made out of desperation. Um, and so in, this in these moments, there is no good options. Um, the mom can terminate the pregnancy, kill the baby, and hope that if she gets pregnant again, she can provide better for that next child. Or she could keep this child know that she's done with her education, know she's not gonna be able to provide, know she's gonna have to listen to that baby cry when they're hungry, when they're sick, she's not gonna be able to feed them, she's not gonna be able to take them to the hospital. And so we really try to step in and be that good option. Because a lot of times these ladies know it's a life, they want to honor life, they want to keep their baby, but they also know that bringing their baby in for that life isn't good either. And so she's stuck in that hard choice, and so we try to be that good option there. 
And this is our partner. Um, his name is Mackinson Liesma, and so he's the one, like, we're here right now. So he's the one taking care of everything. Um, we have known him since late 2012, and he has become a close friend of ours. He is married to a lady named Natasha, and they have two little, two little kids, a little boy and a little girl, um, that we're close to as well, and it's always fun. It just says that one of the big focuses of our program is uh, the feeding program. And um, so as you can imagine, these kinds of girls who don't have a, a good place to go, um, a lot of times they're kicked out of their house by their family or whoever they might have been staying with at the time that wasn't even their family in the first place. Um, food is a top priority for living, you know, and especially to have a, a good and healthy life. So. So quality, nutritious food in Haiti is hard to come by, or more to say it exists, but a lot of people can't afford to buy it, you know? Um, it's hard to even grow crops right now, actually. That's a kind of a side issue because their money is becoming worth less and less, but um, it's, it's more expensive for people to grow, more expensive for people to buy. So we want to make sure that the moms are very well nourished um, because they're carrying a baby at first, you know. We want them, their, their babies to be nourished as well as we can, which means making sure the mom has good nutrition. And then we continue that after childbirth as well. Um, clean water is also incredibly important. We want them to be safe and healthy and not to get, you know, waterborne diseases. Um, it's amazing throughout the world how easy it is to get diseases from unclean water. Um, so it's, it's, again, it's not that expensive, but you can't drink the water out of your tap. So for us, it's kind of cheap to go buy water, you know. For them, having to do that every, you know, few days or every week, it adds up. Um, it's still probably more than paying our water bills here, you know, as far as the drinking aspect goes. So um, everything is expensive for them in Haiti. Um, so one out of five children in Haiti is malnourished. Um, and so malnourished isn't just like, oh, I'm hungry tonight. Um, but there are physical things happening to your body because it's lacking nutrients. So one, one in 10 are acutely malnourished. And so these are going to be developmental delays that cannot be fixed. So if you're malnourished, but you start getting correct vitamins, nutrients, things like that, you can catch up. Um, if you're acutely malnourished, there is going to be lifelong effects from that. Um, and about 7% of children in Haiti will die before their seventh birthday. And that's once you get past that birth rate um, that is way lower than America's as well. Um, so stunting, it's a term used for those developmental delays in those kids um, as a direct result of that malnutrition. And so at the bottom, there's a little cycle diagram. Um, and it starts with an underweight baby being born and they become a stunted child, a malnourished young girl, who becomes a malnourished mother who gives, weight, gives birth to another underweight baby. Um, and so it's a cycle that just keeps happening. Um, if you are underweight when you're born and nobody has, nobody's able to give you what you need um, to close that gap, then it just keeps continuing. So some statistics um, show us that the rate of stunting is directly related to a mother's education. Um, and so 34% of children born to a mother who hasn't finished secondary school, who's had no formal education, um, are stunted, which is a lot. Um, a third of children in Haiti and, yeah, in Haiti and other developing countries, I believe is in this statistic, are mentally and physically impaired because of nutrition. So they're not gonna be as tall, um, but also their brains aren't going to work the same way ours do. They're not going to have the critical thinking skills that come um, Honestly, a lot of times from our good nutrition. You learn those things, you're taught those things, but you're also able to learn those things because your body is being fed, your brain is being fed and taught to do so. Um, with 12% being stunted who have a mom who finished secondary school. So 12% is still a lot of children. Um, that's still a big problem, but it's also still significantly less than that 34%. And so if your mom has finished secondary school, she probably knows more of what to feed you. She probably has a better idea of, okay, so these cookies um, that are super cheap and I can buy on the street might make my baby stop crying right now, but that's all they're really gonna do because it's really just calories and it's not helping them. But if I save and buy something that's only gonna make them stop crying for maybe less time or maybe for today, I'm spending more money on it, but that's gonna help my baby more in the long run. And so those educational benefits of her making those choices, even when she has a little to make it go further as far as nutrition is concerned. 
Um, we'll talk a little bit about grocery shopping in Haiti. Um, this is the public market. It is outdoors, as you can see. Um, there are supermarkets in Haiti, but you know a lot of people can't afford to buy things in the supermarkets. This is just kind of the general um, market where people go to find the best deals on things. Um, it's really crowded. Um, if you can imagine, that picture on the left is one of the walkways. People are actually supposed to be able to drive through there. Um, it's not a good idea. We tried it one time, exactly one, one time, um, because legally they're not supposed to be that far out, but there's booths, and then there's people in front of booths, sometimes the same person just kind of extending their space, sometimes it's a, a totally different person just kind of squatting literally and figuratively in front of them um, to have their own little space. So it is something else. Every week we give them a bag of food at the meeting. Um, we start with some of the basic things, you know, calories, rice and beans. Um, beans, of course, are actually very good for you, so that helps to make the rice not just be rice, you know, the grain and some beans. Um, vegetables, they like to put vegetables in a lot of things, obviously very good for you. Spaghetti is one thing that they actually eat for breakfast a lot, um, sometimes for lunch too, but it's, it's a lot different than our, you know, Italian. But it's really interesting. Um, eggs for protein, meat for protein, things like that. Um, oil, because they cook everything in oil. Basically, every food that you eat there has been fried at least once, maybe twice. Um, we give them a lot of spices and, and things like that, you know, seasoning so that their food can taste good as well. Good for you and good for your mouth. So we meet every Tuesday at noon. So at the meetings, um, we do a few things. We catch up on the girls' weeks, kind of just check in with them, see how they're doing, uh, what they've been doing, see if anybody's sick, if their babies are sick, um, things like that. We do a devotion, and we have prayer time together. Um, that's one of the, the key aspects of our ministry, being you know a Christian mission. We hand out their weekly food at the end of that as they're on their way out the door. Um, this is to provide them with the food, and it's also to kind of just give that extra incentive for them to come to the meeting, because that's when you receive your food. Prenatal care and hospital visits. So this is the outside of the maternity ward at our public hospital. We don't actually use it very often anymore, um, but we had some really interesting experiences in this building. Um, currently, we deliver most of our babies at a private hospital um, right down the way. They have a little bit better technology, better medicine, better doctors on hand. So a typical appointment, um, you show up somewhere between 8 and 9 a.m., and you sit in a line. Eventually, you see a nurse. She tells you, okay, well, I think your doctor's going to want to see this blood work. She's going to want to you to get this or that swabbed, she's gonna want this or that. So then you leave premise, the premises and you go to a pharmacy. You go buy all those things, take all those tests, do that lab work. Um, it's not on the street, it's in a building, but it's basically on the street. And then you bring those results back. Um, and so you might not actually see the doctor until 2.30 or almost three, which makes for a really long day. Um, especially if you're a pregnant woman sitting on hard seats all day. Um, but that is our typical appointment. Um, so their hospitals are super different in everything. Um, there's no AC. The doctors are sometimes there, sometimes they're not. Um, sometimes you can wait all day until three and then the doctor says, I'm out. And so then you come back tomorrow. But a lot of it has to do with how little the doctors get paid. Um, they're not really incentivized to be there or to provide good medical care because of that. Um, which is also why we switched a lot to the other hospital because he, he has incentive in his own business because he owns it. And so he has to treat people well and be there and things like that for people to keep coming back. So the average cost of having a baby in the US, according to Google, is $8,802. Um, the average cost of having a baby in Haiti is about 150, which also tells you that discrepancy in doctor pay comes from that as well. But what that means is that you don't have near the things that you have here. Um, so an epidural isn't a thing. If you're getting a C-section, the cost of that delivery is gonna be a lot more than 150 to cover things like that. Um, so these are some of our babies. This is my favorite part. I get to show you all our baby pictures. So these were our twins, which were our very first delivery um, just over two years ago now. And I do know that my sister has kept you updated on a lot of these things, but so they were born prematurely and it was crazy and I still sometimes am in awe at God and how they made it. Um, they're five pounds, six ounces and two pounds, seven ounces. And those are babies that may or may not make it here. 
Um, but there was no NICU. There was a little incubator thing, but the person who knew how to work it was out of town. And so the baby didn't even get put in there. Um, I was holding the two pound baby and being like, I've never touched a baby this small because they don't let you. Um, they put them in the incubator and maybe you can put your finger in, but you don't get to just hold them, let alone everyone who comes and visits you hold this two pound baby. Um, literally, by the grace of God, they made it and we just celebrated their second birthday. And so that's that bottom picture. Um, they made a mess, but they always do. After that, we have Dave. Um, to date, we've delivered 10 babies as an organization, and he is still our only little boy delivered with us. <laughs> How that statistic works, I'm not really sure, but so that is Dave. And then we have Mariah Carey. Um, her mom is on the left, um, and she passed away during childbirth, which was one of the hardest things, for sure, that I've had to deal with. Um, wasn't expected and wasn't something you can ever mentally prepare for. Um, but she is doing great now, and her mother had told us she wanted to name her Mariah Carey. We thought she was joking. She wasn't, and the people, her um, boyfriend and his mom honored that she wanted that, and so her name is Mariah Carey. And then we have Miss Sengal and Francis. Adrienne and Andres. Um, so she is one of our newer babies. She just turned a year old. Um, our last baby born with us um, is Wutne. Um, Miriam's her mom, and she was born in January. And then we have this mom and her little boy. Um, his name is Downsley, and her name is Joanne. He is a boy. I did not lie. He, hasn't, he wasn't born with us. Um, so he is in our program now. Their situation was unique, and there's always exceptions made in ministry. Um, but so they are with us now. So Dave does have a friend, finally. Um, although he's one of the boys, he's one of the babies we have every day. So he's used to hanging out with girls all day anyway. He's kind of a bully, but it's whatever. All right, we'll talk a little bit about education now. Um, this is just a picture of a school in town um, to kind of give you an idea of just the way that they paint things, the way that, you know, that's just a wall outside of the building. Everything in town or anywhere you build in Haiti is going to have a wall outside of it if you can possibly help it, which as you can imagine is expensive for everyone to build a wall around every structure, but it's really necessary for security. About 90% of Haitian schools are run by religious organizations or other non-government organizations. Um, public schools do exist, but they're that 10%, which is especially funny because one of the many things that they've been promised in the last, I mean, I think that's in the Haitian constitution actually, right? Yeah, um, is you know, free public school for everyone. So it's not working out very well. That's kind of a symbol of Haitian culture, Haitian government in general. Average school fees obviously are going to vary from school to school, um, but tuition, uniform, books is going to be something like $400 a year. Um, it gets more expensive as you get into higher grades, so that's kind of somewhere in the middle, just to give you an idea. About two-thirds, or 67% of elementary-aged children are in school. So that's, you know, kindergarten through fifth grade. Um, only two-thirds of the kids in that age group are even in school at all, um, and only about under 22% of those children get to continue on into middle school, which is early secondary education. So right away we have a huge drop off um, in the education rate. Much of this is because of expense. People can't afford to go to school. The average income in Haiti is not very high, and so um, $400 a year doesn't sound like all that much, but you know, when it's a third or it's 1800. 1800, so between a quarter and a fifth of your annual income, that's a lot of income right away for one kid. And then if you have four kids, you have to kind of pick and choose who gets to go to school this year or that year. So people have a lot of gaps in their education very commonly, sometimes don't finish school. Um, only 4% of students um, who can be up to age 24 when they finish um, school have completed secondary school or high school. Um, and only 3% go on to post-secondary education, some kind of college or extended professional training. So uh, that drop off just gets very sharp. So as you see, up to age 24, some people don't even finish high school until well after age 20 um, because they've had to miss this year, miss that year, miss the other year. You know, they've had to work or they just didn't have the money to go to school. 
along with sending these girls to finish their education, and we offer childcare for the babies. Um, this is something we always wanted to do, and we didn't have at first, but we've got it going now um, for some time. So the girls who don't have an easy childcare option near them, um, they just swing by our house before school. Uh, right now our house, or our apartment is our office also. So they swing by the, the apartment slash office, they drop their kids off, and they go to school for the day. Um, and then they know that their kids are in a safe and caring environment while they go to school. We'd had some problems before that with people missing school, even when we arranged childcare, because it's the Caribbean and people are just kind of, you know, things come up and they don't necessarily tell you, the communication is not good. So um, it's really important to us to have the steady, kind of safe, secure, um, and caring option for them every single day. So our goal is to help these moms, these girls, be self-sustaining. That is our ultimate goal as far as program features go, right? We have a lot of spiritual goals for them, but functionally, we don't, we want to partner with them for a long time, right? We want to get them through their whole secondary education, at least, if possible. That is our, our big functional goal. We want them to be self-sustaining, so we want them to have the education they need in order to get a good job and take care of themselves, take care of their new, their baby, their family, right? Um, that small family unit, because, you know, nobody wants to be, take handouts forever, right? Nobody, nobody feels comfortable with that, even if, it, even if you have to, even if you need that, even if you don't have anybody, any other option, you know, something in, in the human person doesn't like that. It's not what we were made to do. So we want them to ultimately be able to work and be able to support their family. But, so the name of our ministry is Love of a Father Ministries, um, and we want to be that for our girls. Um, so the message behind our ministry is just as important as what we do. So we told you what we do. We feed them. We help them deliver their babies safely. We get them their education. Um, but we do all of this while expressing the love of our Father. We serve these girls and we love them. We do all of this because Christ loves them. And so our daily mission is to be that love to them in a way that they haven't seen it before. Um, so in Haiti, there's no government aid, there's no WIC, there's no welfare, there's nothing to help these girls. Um, and so them and their babies truly are the least of these that we are asked to help in scripture. Um, they have nobody. Their families aren't going to help them, but a lot of times they're kicked out of their houses. Um, the church doesn't talk about sex um, until you're pregnant, and then it's wrong, and then you're a bad example, and then you have to leave. And so at this point, our girls are left confused and lost. Um, they can't go back to their church because their church said, no, like you're a bad example to all the other girls. They can't go back to school. Um, it's been significantly harder than I would have ever dreamed for us to find schools that will accept our girls. Because the moment they find out our girls have babies, they don't deserve an education anymore. Um, because they're a bad influence, they're this or that. And so it's the secret that they have to keep while they're at school. Um, which can be really hard, especially if you're breastfeeding and things like that, and things happen, and but people can't find out, or you don't get to go to school. And their families don't have the money to take care of another mouth, so a lot of times they are kicked out of their homes. Um, we have two girls currently who are searching for housing. Um, we're assisting them in trying to find options, um, haven't been able to yet, and aren't at a place where we can have a housing facility yet. Although that is in the dreams, that is in what we want to do um, because it's become evident that it's necessary. I wanted to push stay with your family as often and as much as you can because um, that family unit is core. And if that baby can grow up with a mom and a grandpa and a grandma, that's better um, than just a mom. But a lot of times it's not possible. So the fathers rarely hang around. Um, out of 10 deliveries, we've had two dads that are still in the picture. Um, most of them say, oh, that's not my baby. Oh, I didn't do that. Oh, I don't know her. Things like that. She's too poor. So we want to be that love of a father in a tangible way, too, to those babies because they don't have a father. They don't have a father here, um, and fathers help provide for you. Fathers love you. Fathers spend lots of times with you, play with you. And so we can be an earthly father in that way as well. Um, but then for our moms, most of them didn't grow up with dads either. Most of them don't still have a dad who's in the picture. Um, or if he is, he's in and out. Maybe they call him every now and then to send money to help, but it's rare and far between. Um, and so being love of a father definitely exhibits God as our father to them in lots of different dimensions as our heavenly father. 
but also in a way that they never got to learn an earthly father. Thank you guys so much for sharing uh, with us um, and, and letting us know what's going on. I just want to uh, just pray for you guys uh, personally as you get ready to go back that first of all, God makes a way for you to get back. And if he makes a way for you to be delayed, that it's at least, you know, there's safety for the folks that you love and that you care about there uh, in Lakai. Uh, so let's pray. God, um, thank you for Nathan and Katie and the work of Loaf Ministries um, uh, in Haiti. We thank you for these, these young girls that have been encouraged to, um, to give birth to their, to their babies, to raise them well, to feed them. And, and I thank you for the, the education that Loaf is providing, the, the food, the sustenance that they're giving, um, and the, the love of a father that they're giving to them as well. Uh, we do pray uh, for their safety, for Nathan and Katie as they're traveling. Um, we pray, God, that you'd make a way for them to, to go back home um, this weekend. Uh, but God, if that's not possible, we pray for, for safety. We pray for the right timing for them to go. Pray for safety for their, their friends and those that they care about. Uh, we pray to God that you would continue to watch over them. Thank you, God, for the opportunity to partner with them and to encourage them and support them. We pray, God, that uh, you would continue to work through their ministry to change lives um, in Haiti. God, we love you, and it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Community Christian Church, 1944 South Jackson Street, Frankfort, Indiana.